Happy holidays everyone, Julia Usher Recipes for a Sweet Life. As the title of this video says, this is the companion piece to my 3D cookie fireplace video that I did last week, which you still see here. Because that video was rather involved, I decided to cut them into two, and in this piece I'll be showing you how to make many of the edible accessories that grace it. We'll start first with the rugs two ways that are sitting in the foreground, then we'll move on to four other primary pieces with two other little surprise projects thrown in. Those four primary pieces are the fireplace screen, the Christmas tree, the candelabra, which is one of my favorites, and then the fourth are the pretty little cookie frames that sit on the back wall. There are a number of other accessories that deck the halls, as it were, that I won't be covering in this video, and that's because they've been covered in some other videos I've done in the past, and those include the fire, the logs, and also the little plates. So I refer you off to my video description. You'll find links to all of those videos that detail those accessories there. Let's move on to the rugs for this project. Often when I'm conceptualizing a project that's as complex as this, I don't always know what's going to look best, so I like to make different options of the same thing so I have some flexibility when it comes to the final arrangement. And so is the case with these rugs. I've actually made them in two different ways, which you can see here. I've got some stamped fondant rugs, and that's actually what's also depicted in the foreground there. I've also got some airbrushed rugs, and I, you can airbrush on either fondant or royal icing transfers. This is a royal icing transfer, which is a piece of royal icing I piped, let set, and then I airbrushed on it. Whereas these that have a little bit of contour were shaped first, were airbrushed and then shaped while the fondant was still moist. You can also stamp on royal icing, but I just am going to show you stamped fondant in this particular case. So what do you need to do both of those variations? Let's start first with the fondant piece. Of course you need some fondant. You can use white or colored fondant. I like to roll it through to a very thin setting. On my pasta machine you can also use a rolling pin if you don't have a pasta machine. You'll need an uninked stamp pad. This is now colored because I have food coloring on it. We'll be stamping with food coloring the same liquid gel food coloring that I normally use to color my icings. And then a stamp, of course. I chose this one because it looks kind of like a braided rug, and that's what it looks like stamped, and a cutter to cut around the fondant. This is about a two and three quarter inch cutter, which works nicely in the foreground that I have exposed there, which is only about three inches. Now for the second set of accessories to do airbrushed rugs, I am going to use royal icing transfers in this case, but again, you could work with fondant. I've got some royal icing transfers pre-made, and I'm going to show you how to make them as well in any shape, rectangles or circles, again, sizing them to fit the available space on the vignette. You'll need something to pipe the transfers on, and this is where this acetate-covered board comes in handy with a little template behind it. And then to get the patterns on it, I'm going to be using either one of two stencils. This is one of my stencils. It's actually from one of my Thanksgiving prettier plaque sets, but it looks kind of like a braided rug if I use it twice, as you'll see here. So I think I'll be replicating this rug. You could also go towards more of an elegant look with a more frilly pattern stencil. This looks sort of like an oriental rug, if you will. And of course, to do that, you'll need some airbrush coloring. I'm going to be working with red and green to make that braided rug I showed you earlier, as well as an airbrush and a compressor. And of course, we'll be working with my new Julia airbrush. I have a couple of other videos coming out that I'll describe in great detail how to use and clean this airbrush. So let's get started with the first fondant stamped rug. Okay, so this is where we're headed to stamped rugs, but I'm going to be doing this one in red just for a little bit of variety. First step is getting your fondant nice and pliable and start it out in the direction you want it to be, in the shape you want it to be. And then I roll it first on the widest opening of my pasta machine. And then take it down to about the number three or four setting, which will be about one sixteenth of an inch thick. Make sure those roller blades are clean. If anything's stuck on them, the fondant will be sticky. You just want this wet 
and tacky, not completely glossy. And then oftentimes with big stamps, rather than inking it that way, it's easier to see that it's inked if you do it this way. And apply nice, firm, even pressure. Sometimes I let the fondant dry a little bit so that you don't get your stamps stuck in the fondant. And you could take a cutter that's big enough to capture the edge, but I'm going to cut it just short of that because I'm going to be putting on my own border. Just center it. And now we just want to move it onto a cardboard and put a little border on it. So you could do the border either now or later after the fondant's dried, but in this case I'm going to do a simple dotted border. It's pretty minimal and it's also not going to hit the surface when I pipe it. So I can do it before without it sticking to whatever I'm piping it on. If you were going to do a fringy type border, which would be longer, I would suggest waiting to apply that until you get the rug situated on the vignette because it may end up sticking to whatever you're piping it onto. So I'm working with my beadwork consistency icing and I'm just going to go all the way around like so. Now onto the second type of rug. This is going to be a piped royal icing transfer and let's talk a little bit about why you would use a transfer versus rolled fondant. Personally it's just to me down to which one you prefer taste wise. Some people don't love the chewiness and texture and flavor of rolled fondant and might prefer just pure icing on their cookie. If you've got icing everywhere else, why change out the media? So whichever medium you choose can be your choice. The only advantage to fondant is there is some flexibility. So you can also do the same technique of stenciling and airbrushing on fondant, cut out a piece of fondant, stencil on it, and then while the fondant's still wet or malleable, you can shape the fondant. So here I've lifted up a little corner of the rug to look as if Santa had kicked it up when he came down the chimney. In the case of royal icing, you're going to be working with something that's completely flat, so it won't have as much dimension. That's the only downside of it. But either will work equally well for this technique. And we'll be creating a transfer and airbrushing onto it. Once it's completely dry, you can pull it off the acetate. So transfer refers to putting icing on some other surface, in this case acetate or parchment paper, but I like acetate because it's less likely to buckle as the icing dries, letting it dry, and then moving it off and transferring it onto the end piece. Now we're going to pipe on it. I'm going to use two consistencies of icing, one to outline, which is relatively thick, and then one to flood it. And this piece is about three and a half by two and a quarter inch. Again, size just to fit the foreground of that piece. And I just want to do the basic rug now, no borders, because we're going to be airbrushing over it and I don't necessarily want to airbrush any fringe or trim that's going to be on the rug. This trim would be applied later. And now I'm working with my looser flooding consistency icing. At first I start by pushing a lot of icing into the space. But as I get enough in there, I will bury my tip into the icing and just push it around as I'm doing here. So I'm not adding more icing here. I'm just pushing it around and trying to make it as level as possible as I go. When I run out of icing, I'll push more in and just repeat that process until the entire piece is completely full. Now as I come to the end, I want to be careful about overfilling and getting overflow. So I'm going to pipe just short of the corner and then work the icing into the corner more carefully with my trussing needle or scribe tool, like so. And while the icing is still wet, you want to come back in immediately and pop any air bubbles and smooth down any lumpy spots. And then set it aside to dry. Okay, so once this is completely dry, we're ready to airbrush. And again, I'm going to be going towards this braided rug effect, which involves application of two colors. Okay, so the first step is laying that stencil flat and flush against the icing. Sometimes weighting down the corners with magnets helps, but in this case it was laying flatter without, so I'm going without the magnets. 
And as with any airbrushing of details, I like to work at close range, one to two inches away with low pullback and low flow out of the airbrush. Once that first color is down, ta-da! It will dry nearly instantaneously. I can reset the stencil, staggering the little braided areas and just apply the red. And ta-da, there you have it. Now we'd let this completely dry and only after it's completely dry would we, and completely airbrushed, would we remove the royal icing from the acetate sheet. It just keeps it from moving around during airbrushing if you leave it on the acetate until you're through. And again, border details would be applied later so you don't airbrush over them. If I were to do any fringe, I would actually apply that directly on the finished vignette because it's likely to break if I were to do it separately. Okay, on to the second little mini project, the picture frames. I've got ones of various sizes on the back wall, one with a big Santa right over the fireplace and even some very tiny oval ones that are sitting on the mantel top. And they're all basically made the same way. What you'll need to do that is not terrifically too much. Here's a sample of the bigger picture frame, not attached to the picture yet. And then I've got many little oval ones suitable for the top of the mantle. Mini square ones with all sorts of different pictures. These are suitable for either the mantle or the back wall. Okay, so to make the big frame, it's going to start looking something like this. This one's about three inches tall, but I'll have the exact dimensions in the video descriptions. By contrast, the little one that goes on the mantle is no more than an inch tall and about three quarters inches wide. And I use my gingerbread dough because I want them to be gold and it's easier to color dark dough gold than to start with a light dough. So we'll be working with my gingerbread. Again, the link to the recipes in the video description. You'll need some silicone frame molds. These are normally for molding fondant, but they work perfectly well in the oven. We're going to be baking in the molds to create that impression. Small ones and a large one. This is the first impressions mold. The source of this I don't know offhand, but the link will be in the video description, which is where I always put my sources. To turn that from gingerbread color into gold, I'll be showing you two different highlighting techniques. One that involves spraying, which creates very broad, even coverage and a second one which involves sponging which normally just highlights the top, the very top texture of a cookie. So that gives a slightly different, more two-tone effect. Then to make the little picture itself, it'll go behind the frame, i.e. something like this. We're going to be working with pre-printed edible papers, wafer papers, and a little bit of fondant so that you don't see through the paper and to act as a firm backing piece. So we'll be rolling fondant through my pasta machine, cutting it into various sizes to fit the frames. And then we'll be applying to that dried fondant, once it's completely dry, little pre-printed edible images. This is a wafer paper. It's rather sheer and see-through. That's part of the reason why I'm putting it on fondant. You can also print on frosting sheets and you might be able to apply them directly to the back of the frame. But because this is wafer paper, I am backing it with fondant. It also adds a little bit of sweetness, which is nice. You could also take regular wafer paper or edible papers and actually draw or paint on them, though apply the coloring very gingerly because the wafer paper is very susceptible to water and will buckle and change shape, even dissolve if you apply too much paint, water, or alcohol to it. And then to attach it, we're going to be using just a dab of corn syrup because, as I said, if it gets too moist, this paper, it will buckle and change shape and even dissolve. So to create these picture frames, really simple process. I have a whole nother video on embossed cookies and I refer you to that for more detail. I'm basically gonna pack these fondant molds as tight as I can without too much overflow on top with the gingerbread dough and then bake the dough in the mold. I prefer to bake in the mold whenever possible because the dough cannot expand and spread and therefore you're going to get much more definition out of any particular mold. Alternatively, if you don't have a lot of molds and you have to make a lot of these, you can pack the dough in it, freeze it for a few minutes and then pop the dough out and then continue to reuse the mold and bake out of the mold. That will work, however, the dough will always spread a little bit in that case and you'll get a little bit less definition. Now just really press it in 
And you'll notice I don't have a lot of extra dough on top, so I won't have to trim this when it comes out of the oven. So I'm going to do the same packing process for the little frames. Again, all the links to these molds will be found in the video description. Packing as much within the mold without overhang as possible so I don't have to trim it after it's baked. Now we have a couple of different ways to add sheen. I'm going to be talking about both sponging and spraying. Sponging is an effect where you just get sheen on the top of the piece where spraying will go deep into the recesses. So let's start with sponging. I've got a little luster dust here and I'm mixing it with alcohol to turn it into a paint. Blotting off the excess. Then I'll just lightly sponge it on top to highlight the relief. You don't want to sponge too hard or you'll get it deep into the recesses as well. This creates more of a textured and two-tone effect. Now, to get deep into the recesses for a more uniform effect than you might spray it or airbrush, I'm going to spray with PME Luster Spray. It evaporates and dries really quickly and gives a nice even coat. However, it does make a mess and goes very airborne, so you want to make sure you cover and protect your work surfaces. So here's a comparison of the two effects. Sponged on the right, sprayed on the left. Now I'm moving on to the backing piece that will support the wafer paper picture, and that's cut out of rolled fondant that I work through a pasta machine until it's about 1 16th of an inch thick, which is about the number three setting on my pasta machine, and then cut it out with a cutter to fit the appropriate frame. You could also use modeling chocolate here. Now right now it's super flexible and it's going to be hard to handle. As you can see, I messed that one up. So we're going to set these aside to dry once they're cut. I usually allow overnight for them to get rigid. But drying time will depend on the brand of fondant you use. Some dry faster than others. Once dry, we're ready to apply the wafer paper pictures. You could also use printed images on frosting sheets or hand paint directly on the fondant, but this is relatively quick. So I just want to frame the picture within the frame, get a little bit of corn syrup on the fondant piece, and then replace the picture where I want it positioned. Once it's on there, we'll trim it down to the size of the fondant backing piece. like so. Now we're not going to want to see too much of the fondant sticking out behind the picture frame and if the oval is pretty close to the size of the picture frame you may also want to additionally trim it down which you can do with scissors once the fondant is completely dry. Having done that we're ready to glue the frame in place and I'm just using thick royal icing glue. A little bit of white because if any sneaks out it's going to be less likely to show on the picture and we'll clean up any overflow with my handy dandy trussing needle. And it's all set. And that's it. Set it aside to dry. And as I said, you can do them in any number of sizes and shapes. And you'll see that I used all three different sizes and shapes on this vignette here. Okay, for our third mini project, we've got the candelabra, which I think is perhaps my most favorite piece. It's made completely out of royal icing transfers and a touch of fondant for the little stem and also to elevate the royal icing transfers. There are 10 total royal icing transfers in each candelabra. You can see some finished ones here and also in the close-up on the screen. So it's sort of a two-tier candelabra on a footed little pedestal. So to make that, as I said, you'll need 10 royal icing transfers in four different sizes. There is a large size for the plate on which the little candle holders will sit. And I'm going to be arranging them in different orientations too. So the plate, little candle holders, this is the foot of the pedestal, and this piece here will make the top tier of the candelabra. And I've got all the dimensions spelled out. To make those, those transfers, you're going to need a little acetate set up with some guidelines drawn on it. You'll also need a little bit of fondant to put this together. Gold fondant here, I've got it covered because it dries out very quickly. That's going to be used to create a little cylinder to form the stem of the candelabra. And we'll be using a garlic press to create those parts or rolling them by hand, but a garlic press creates nice, perfectly uniform little cylinders. We'll also be using the garlic press to make candles like so. In addition, to put this all together, we need a little bit of icing, which I don't have out here. 
a little bit of orange for the flame, a little bit of gold to stick this all together, and a little bit of forest green to create the greenery into which the candles are going to be inserted. And then finally, to give it all a little bit of sheen, at least the candelabra part, we need a little bit of gold luster spray. Okay, we're ready to make the transfers. Again, transfers are royal icing piped on another surface, in this case acetate, allowed to dry and then moved off to then be de decorated. And that just allows me a lot more design flexibility and arrangement flexibility when I come to piecing this together to have them all pre-made. I like to pipe on acetate, generally speaking, because it bends less as the icing dries and so the pieces, especially as they start to get into the bigger sizes, like for the big plate, are less likely to misshape. But I've got my guidelines drawn out, a quarter of an inch, again, for the candle holders, five-eighths of an inch for the little top tier, seven-eighths inch for the base or the foot of the pedestal, and one and one-eighths for the primary plate, which is this guy here. Okay, I'm starting with the quarter inch beads first because that way I can cut a small hole and then open it up further as I need to when I get to the bigger beads. I need seven of these little candle holders per candelabra and I'm just using the guidelines as a gauge to how wide they should be as opposed to having drawn individual round templates. The guidelines are a much faster way to construct the guide. Now moving on to the 5 8 inch piece. I think I can use the same opening here, again using a circular motion to make sure it's nicely rounded. Of course, if you're doing more than one candelabra, you might want to pipe as many as you need, but I just need one of these pieces per candelabra and one of each of the other two big pieces, so we'll just proceed on down the line with those, opening up the tip if needed. Now once those royal icing pieces are dry, we're ready to assemble. Drying time will vary depending on the size of the piece. I usually allow at least a couple of days for the really large ones. Now to, I'm starting with the top plate here. I've mounted the mini plate on top with just a dab of fondant and a little bit of royal icing glue. The fondant there is to give it a little bit of elevation. And now I'm ready to plant the little candle holders down just with a bit of royal icing glue. And again, we've got seven of those, so you want to equally space them, gluing directly onto the bottom plate. Now I'm ready to detail back to my beadwork consistency icing. Just going to do some dots around the upper plate. Now onto the pedestal, that's what we're aiming for. To make the little support piece, I'm back to rolled fondant. I'm just rolling with my hands. We're going to be using a garlic press to make some candles shortly, which will give a more uniform, thinner piece. We also want to make a little hole in the 7th, 7 8 inch piece to accommodate the support once it's dry. And I used my trussing needle to carve out a little hole. Once the fondant's dry, I just glue it in with a little bit of thick royal icing and set it aside to dry. You want that to be very dry before you put the top plate on it, so generally I allow at least a half an hour. Then we'll come back in as you'd like and detail lines with outlining consistency and dots with beadwork consistency up along the pedestal and also on the base. Now once dry we're ready to attach. Again I use a little bit of fondant on top of royal icing to act as a bed, a little nesting area if you will for the plate. It just allows it to rest more securely more quickly. And then a little bit of royal icing glue on top and make sure it's nicely centered from both directions front to back and side to side before you set it aside to dry. Now while that's drying, let's work on the candles. They too are little cylinders of fondant, but to get them perfectly uniform and a little bit thinner, I did press the fondant through a garlic press. There are tons of different kinds of extruding tools for fondant that you can buy online. This is just a normal garlic press, a lot cheaper than some of those fondant specific tools. To straighten them out, I'll also often kind of smoosh them gently between paring knives or spatulas. Once they're completely dry, you can pick them up and use a little dab of royal icing to create a flame. Now we're onto the swags on the candelabra once it's completely dry. I'm using a loose outlining consistency for this that holds a nice shape but also bends in a nice arc. And I'm just connecting between the candle holders, putting one swag between each, cleaning up any extra icing as I go and we'll continue on in that fashion all the way around the candelabra. Making contact, letting the icing drop in a natural curve to the same depth as the previous one and then making contact again to break the icing flow. Okay, once the swags are reasonably dry, we're ready to give it shimmer for the holiday season. You can do that a couple of ways. You can either spray the coloring on with an airbrush 
and gold airbrush coloring as I'm doing here. I'm doing that because I didn't allow a lot of drying time and the airbrush coloring comes out relatively gently. You can also use canned airbrush sprays, but they come out with a lot more force and could knock those swags off if they're not completely dry. Either will work. Again, I'm choosing the airbrush because it's got a little more gentle spray. And as I'm spraying, I'm holding down the base with the tip of my trussing needle to keep the piece from blowing over altogether. Now we're ready to deck it out with candles. I've got a little thick green royal icing and a number 262 tip that creates kind of a look of evergreens. It's a closed star tip. I'm going to pipe a blob on top and just stick one of those dried candles in place. You may need to wait a little bit between candles just to allow adequate drying time so they don't fall into each other. But we'll proceed as quickly as we can. The thicker the green icing is, the faster this can go. Now onto the lower level, and we'll just repeat this process all the way around. Okay, onto the fourth element on the vignette, which is the fireplace screen. There are a couple of different ways you can construct it. What you've got up here, and this is all propped up with various props, none of them are really meaningful, they're just keeping this delicate piece from falling over. This piece is comprised of four little individually piped screen elements. They're each about three quarters inch by one and three quarters inch tall, and I'll have the exact dimensions in the video description. Four elements all pieced together to create a screen. In the vignette in the front, I have one single bigger piece across the front and two side pieces, so three total elements. So I'll be showing how to pipe the smaller elements and probably piecing together a fireplace screen that looks somewhat like the one up front. At the end of all of this, I'm going to show you another royal icing transfer, a little sneak peek of the stockings and how they were put together. They're very similar in terms of being a transfer, so I'm not going to belabor their particular methodology. Let's focus on the screen. With that being said, all you really need for this project are black icing, royal icing, in two consistencies, an outlining consistency and a thick flooding consistency. I don't have them out here, but they're in cones over there ready to be used. You need an acetate setup. Here I've got templates drawn about three quarters inch wide, one and three quarters inches tall for the individual small fireplace screen elements and various guidelines at the top. This guideline here tells me I don't want to go much higher than about one and three quarters inches on this particular screen. This line up above is a two inch mark. I've also got a similar grid marked out for the wide fireplace screen element that I used up there, two inches across here and then two inches all the way up to the top line. So in that particular case I'd be piping it a little bit higher with smaller side panels. I'm piping on acetate because these are very delicate transfers. I find that if I pipe on parchment paper, the parchment paper buckles as the icing dries and it can really break some of these more fragile pieces. However, things take a lot longer to dry on acetate, so you want to make sure these are completely dry before you attempt to remove them or you may end up breaking the pieces in that case too. Typically I do these about a week ahead of time and I'm completely assured that, the, that they're dry. And it's all on a support piece here. It's a mini cookie sheet, but it could be a cardboard so I can move it around more easily. For the assembly process, you'll no, just need a few things, a support cardboard with some non-skid material on it and various little supports. I've got different fondant molds. You can use rubber stamps, little sponges, whatever you can find to keep the thing standing up as it dries. Once it's dry, we're going to be adding a little luster to it so it looks like burnished brass or bronze. So to give it that luster, we'll be spraying it with PME Edible Luster Spray in bronze, as opposed to the gold we used on the candelabra. So let's get started with piping the transfers. So I've got my acetate set up. I'm just going to be doing one of the smaller square panels. The first step is to outline it and get the basic structure. So I'm aiming for something like this. And when that's completely dry, we'll come in and detail it with some of these crossbars and things. Okay, I'm ready to start outlining the frames for the fireplace screens, the small parts. And I'm using my outlining consistency icing. The consistency adjustments, a link to them can be found in the video description. And I'm just following the guides that I marked out earlier, going up about one and a half inches out of the total of one and three quarters inches and about three quarters of an inch across. Again, the dimensions will be in the video description. Once I've piped this outer frame, I'm going to come in and pipe another interior rectangle about an eighth of an inch or less away from the outer rectangle. 
you could of course trace this all out, but I'm just eyeballing it here as it's a little more expedient. Piping relatively slowly so I don't break lines. It's easy to break lines when the icing is thick if you pipe too fast. Now moving to the top arc, this will take it up to about one and three quarters inch or slightly over. And again, I want to do this twice because we're going to be filling in later between these lines. I have a little bit of a big blob here, so I just want to knock that down with my trussing needle so it's not so obvious in the final piece. Now while that icing's still wet, I want to move on to a slightly looser consistency. This way the two icings will blend together and I'll see less of that outline in the final project, in the final piece that is. Whereas if I were to wait, I'd see more of the outline because the outline would have dried. You're looking for a consistency of icing here that has some body and isn't going to sink back into itself, but doesn't have so much body that it doesn't leave a smooth line. So I'm working with a relatively thick flooding consistency. And we'll just go all the way around filling between these two lines. The last step right now is to pipe a dot in the center. This is decorative but also functional. It acts as a support for the more delicate crossbars that will be piping on top of it later. Without it, those crossbars can sag and stick to the acetate and are more likely to break off when I remove the final piece from the acetate. Just as an example of some of those 2 by 2 center grates that I piped. Same basic construct. I started by piping a large frame and some crossbars that were large, let that dry, and then I came back in with all the fine little detail work. Okay, now that those frames are completely dry, we're ready to pipe the detail work. I'm back to my outlining icing, and we do need those frames completely dry because I am making contact with the frame, and I don't want to mess it up, which I would do if it were still somewhat wet. The basic piping motion is to touch down, let the icing fall, and then to make contact with that center bead. I'm trying not to cross lines too often and have them make contact because in the process of one line hitting another, you can sometimes break the one you previously piped. I'm also piping rather slowly so as not to break the thick icing. You could pipe any which way. I'm just piping radiating lines from the center out to the corners on both sides of the rectangle. Now some dots at the top, not necessarily to clean up that area, but just to add a little extra level of detail. Once those are completely dry, they're ready to be taken off the acetate, but I do like to do this carefully by pulling one off at a time. So I'm going to cut the acetate around the piece that I'm paying attention to, then flip it over and gently peel back the acetate. I am not pulling on the royal icing piece. It's extremely delicate. If I were to do that, chances are I'd break it. So it came off beautifully and it's very lovely and I would set that on something soft like paper towel for storage purposes. Okay, to assemble you just want to make sure that you're working on a soft surface like paper towel or bubble wrap and that you've got the first piece adequately supported from front to back so it doesn't flip over because it will break. I'm using the big 2x2 two two piece and two small side pieces and just about three or four dabs of thick royal icing glue on the sides to attach one piece to the other, like so. I'm going to orient the side piece to the back. I don't want the overall screen being much more than two by two wide because it needs to fit into my fireplace opening or right in front of it. So again, a few dabs of royal icing. I don't want to over encumber it with icing because I don't want it to show from the front. And stick on that side piece. The side pieces may need support as well. And I'm just gently leaning those rubber stamps up against them. Don't want to press them in too hard or you'll break those pieces. And then reinforcing the upper seams from the back to give it a little more stability with a little more royal icing. Now once this piece is completely dry, we can spray it. I am using a canned luster spray here, PME bronze spray, to make it look sort of like antique bronze, just doing short gentle spurts because I don't want to break any of these pieces. You could also airbrush it with bronze airbrush coloring, I'm leaving it supported the entire time so it doesn't flip over under the force of the spray, especially the canned sprays, which can be quite forceful. 
And again, that just adds a nice bit of luster for the holiday season and sparkle to the overall vignette. I'm going to let that thoroughly dry, especially at the seams, before I attempt to pick it up and put it in front of my fireplace. In the meantime, I'm going to walk you through, talk you through probably, how I make the stockings that go behind the fireplace screen on the fireplace. They follow a very similar transfer technique. In order to do them, first step was to create templates. I found these little stocking shapes online. I squished them down to dimensions that were perfect for my project and created a similar template. There's a wide variety of stocking styles you can ultimately have, but they all basically start the same way. I start by piping in the toe, heel, and trim areas with white or with red. But because I'm putting two contrasting colors next to each other, I do allow the white to dry completely before I pipe in the interior color, the red in this case. Now once that's all dry, I want to add a little more dimension to the top part of the stocking, and I do that by overpiping this little area, as you can see here. And again, I overpipe once the underlying white icing and red icing are completely dry to prevent bleeding of one color into the other. I'm just going to show you one painted technique here. I'm painting on airbrush coloring to create the plaid effect in the stockings you see at the top. This is straight up airbrush coloring using a flat brush. Ideally one not as damaged as mine. I got a little hair there that I'd love to cut off. But we're going to just pipe stri stripes across, allow that airbrush coloring to dry, and then come in with an edible marker to do the fine line details in black. But you want to let the underlying airbrush coloring dry completely, or the black can bleed into the green coloring. We're going to do them horizontally and also vertically to complete the plaid. Then, of course, you can overpipe details with royal icing, either line or dot work trims on the top of the stocking and along the feet. It's best to go in one fast motion. If you can, the line will be less squiggly. But otherwise, just draw as you normally would on the icing once it's completely dry. And then I'd come in in detail, of course, to hide these funny little seams with more royal icing. But again, I've shown that countless times, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Once it was all decorated, then's the time to lift it off the acetate so it's not floating around on you as you decorate. And then my final step is to turn it over and to glue a little thin gold thread. This is the only thing that's not edible so that we can hang the stockings from the fireplace. Okay, the last element that I'm going to show you is the beautiful little Christmas tree like the one in the foreground. I've got another version with a gold garland that's going to be showing overhead. And that was modeled roughly after these funny bristle brush Christmas trees that are flocked. You'll notice I've got some flocking of nonpareils and sanding sugar on these trees. So this is a little more involved accessory than some of the others. So let me walk you through what we're going to need for that. For a tree of that height, which is five tiers, you're going to need five domed cookies in graduated sizes. And I'm going to show you how I bake one of these. I often use my graduated silicone molds as the forms for these. I use two on that particular mold. And I'll have all the dimensions in the video description one from this next size, and so on and so forth. This is a more conical mold, which I thought would be appropriate for the treetop. Now, if you don't have these molds, which typically come in large sheets, I've cut them down for easy handling here on set. If you can't get these, they're somewhat expensive or don't want to get them, you can often use perfectly rounded teaspoons for this project as well. Of course, I'm missing the big tablespoon here that you'd need for the bottom tier. But you can shape dough over these metal items and bake on them as well. Now, after I create the pieces, I'm going to be icing them with green royal icing, which I don't have on set, and a pastry bag using a number 262 tip that looks kind of leafy. Once that's done, we want to create a base for the tree, which I'm going to make out of modeling chocolate and rolling some elements for that base through my pasta machine. We'll then want to skirt it to create kind of that ruffled skirt there or a more flat skirt as I've got on my gold tree. And for doing that, I'm going to be rolling white fondant through my pasta machine, stamping it with a rubber stamp. I do this technique quite often. And in fact, it's very similar to the rug that we did earlier. 
I'm going to be using a red ink pad. This came uninked and I've since colored it with red food coloring and we're just going to be doing the same thing. So we'll have a red and white skirt. And then we'll be cutting that down to size, cutting a hole in the middle to wrap it around the trunk of the tree. And then we'll get on to all the elaborate decorating, which will involve flocking the tree with sanding sugar and nonpareils and adding some homemade little ornaments. These are all royal icing transfers that have been painted using that same method that I used on the stockings. I painted green stripes on the white ones and then drew little red stripes on them. Alternatively for these Red ornaments, I painted gold stripes on them and piped little white dots on them. Those are all handmade. You can also save a little time by using store-bought dragees and other little sugar elements like these little gingerbread confetti candies. I use the gingerbread and some homemade candy canes on that tree. I'm going to probably be working with these ornaments and an assortment of dragees on the gold tree. I'm going to try to replicate the gold tree that you see floating around overhead. For this video, I'll likely just decorate the bottom tier because it's a relatively involved process. The same process would apply to all of the successive tiers. Topping it off finally with a little fondant star that's been sprayed gold and is accented with some silver nonpareils. So let's get started with the baking part of this project. So the first step is creating these dome shapes. And as I said, you can make this tree as short or as small as you want. I've got five tiers. If you wanted to make a little mini three-tiered tree, that would be fine too. Ours is going to end up looking something closer like this and even taller once it's iced. So I've made half domes in many other videos, so I'm just going to go quickly on this. I'm, I'm just going to shape the biggest one and I'll have all the dimensions in the video description. I think this one is a little under two inches across or just about two inches. But again, check in the video description for all the dimensions. They're a surer bet than going on what I say here. I'm working with my gingerbread dough simply because I had it made for making the frames earlier. But a sugar cookie dough could work well for these small contoured shapes as long as it doesn't spread too much and crack too much. I like to roll it relatively thin on domed shapes just so I'm assured of less spreading and less cracking. The thicker the dough is, the more likely it is to spread and crack and you want to make sure it's lifting at all times because we need to lift it ultimately up onto this dome. Taking, let me roll it a little bit thinner on this side. Taking a cutter that's bigger than the dome because it needs to go all the way down the sides. I'd say this is a, easily a good inch bigger than the diameter of the dome and it probably even so won't reach all the way down to the sides which is okay. We'll just end up with a little shallower base than we might have otherwise. Then lift that off, center it on the dome, and then just gently press it into the sides. I'm looking at it from overhead to make sure there's no pieces like this flaring out. You want that all tucked in and looking relatively uniform from top down. This little bit of cracking here is not going to be a problem. We're going to be covering this completely with icing. And then if you've stretched it in the process and you have a side that's longer than the others, like this side's kind of long, I'll trim it now. It just means less trimming at the end. Then I pop this on the back of a cookie sheet. I like to bake on the back sides of my pans for more uniform heat circulation for the normal baking time, which is about 8 to 10 minutes at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just looking for light browning around the edges. It might go a little bit faster than that since this is a relatively thin piece and these smaller pieces certainly could bake faster than that. So it's most important to keep an eye on it when checking for doneness. And all these same pieces would proceed in exactly the same way. Once this is out of the oven and cool enough to handle, this will be quite hot, then you can just pop it off. It'll drop right off and let it cool completely off the mold. Okay, so the next step is to get these all covered and make them look evergreen-like. I often dip domes in my other videos, but this I want to give a nice textured look. So I'm reverting to a metal tip. This is a number 262 closed star tip. And a very th thick icing, one that'll hold its shape. And I'm, as you can see, it's holding its shape. I'm just going to be piping beads and pulling back to create a point to kind of create like an evergreen branch, if you will. And I'm just going to demonstrate on the smaller piece. All the big ones would be done exactly the same way. I like to mark off quadrants roughly just so I know how much I have to pipe. 
So I start by doing that, just piping lines, and I work one quadrant at a time. I've got it a little bit elevated so I can get to the bottom and have some icing overhanging. So it's back on the mold that it was baked on and it's just a little bit shorter than the mold so I can get my pastry bag all the way to the bottom. And now I'm going to work top to bottom, just piping these little, that little bead-like motion and staggering them. And I'm kind of pulling up a little bit as I release, so I'm pulling up and away from the cone so that I can fit the next one tucked in underneath. If I were to go down directly, it would be harder to do that. And you definitely want to pipe over that line. We don't really want to see it. And try to avoid hitting the tips of the ones above. So you want it to look kind of spiky. So I have to be pretty close to the edge of whatever it's elevated on so my hand can get all the way down and get coverage at the very bottom of the cone. Okay, so I've got one quadrant done. You'd of course want to go all the way around to complete the piece, covering those marking lines, and let it completely dry. Repeat this for all the pieces. Now that I've got that green icing out, though, I want to show you how I made the garlands that go on the back of the fireplace and also on the front. Here I'm doing a big garland. This will go on the back wall. The dimensions for it will be in the video description. But I start by piping that line that you see there, kind of a swag of the dimension I, I want, and then just continue down the line, piping those beads, pushing in, pulling back, pushing in, pulling back to create spikes until that whole line is filled out. We let that dry, and then that swag lifts off the acetate quite nicely. So you just want to finish it up, coming down from the other side. I've done these fairly deep here, as I said, for the back wall. I also did a shallower version for the lower part of the back wall, directly to the sides of the fireplace, and tiny versions for the fireplace front. Now back to the tree, now that those pieces are dry. I've already started to stack one, but I want to talk a little bit about how to create the base to put it on. I like to do this first so that I can handle the whole piece from the base. I'm using modeling chocolate here to create about a two inch round that's just slightly bigger than the bottom round of the tree. You could also use a cookie here, but I happen to have modeling chocolate handy. Now I'm going to create the trunk just by rolling it into a cylinder and gluing it down with a little bit of thick brown royal icing. Now once that's situated, we glue the first dome directly onto the stump, decorated dome of course. I'm just simulating that here with an undecorated one and then just glue the successive rounds all the way up. Here I'm using green royal icing so that if any peeks out, it's less likely to show. And I'm gonna put on my fourth tier and then a fifth tier. And the basic structure will be complete. Before you start stacking though, do give some drying time to that trunk and base, otherwise the whole thing will be shifting around on you. That's why I had this one started before I got onto video. And just look at this from all directions, side to side, front to back, to make sure that the pieces are relatively centered on each other. Our next step, once that's completely dry, is to flock the tree, kind of like my bottle brush trees you see in the foreground, by piping on a little relatively loose royal icing, and then immediately pouring a combination of dragees and sanding sugar on top. I like to have a tray underneath the tree during this process, of course, to collect those stray nonpareils so that I can harvest them later and recover them for future use. As I'm doing these little areas of snow on the tree, I do like to stagger them so they're not directly underneath each other on each tier. And once I've got all the white nonpareils down, I'd harvest those white nonpareils out of the tray and then move on to the sanding sugar so that I don't have the two different types of things commingling. That way it's harder to reuse the leftovers. I'm just working on the bottom tier. The same process would of course be applied all the way from the bottom to the top. But since we're on video time, I just want to show you the steps around the bottom. The rest I think will be intuitive. Now I'm on to gluing some bigger ornament pieces. These were all royal icing transfers. This little one here I painted much like I painted the stocking and drew on red lines with a red marker as opposed to black lines, as I did on the stocking. 
And this little ornament here, I painted gold stripes on it and then piped little white dots. So you can get really creative with these pieces. Those ornaments are only about a quarter inch in diameter or less. For a little added shimmer, I'm putting on larger three to four millimeter dragees. And again, I like to stagger the ornaments, mix them up so it looks more natural and so that there isn't too much alignment of like things from one tier to the next. So for instance, here I'm putting a red ornament kind of in between the other two red ornaments I have on the bottom tier. Just sticking down with my thick green royal icing so that if any peeks out, it's gonna blend in with the rest of the tree. And we'll continue again in this fashion all the way around getting those big pieces on. Okay, so I'm making the skirt much the way I made the rug very early on in this video. I rolled out white fondant to my number three setting on my pasta machine, which is about a sixteenth of an inch thick. And by the way, I'm doing the skirt before my last step, which is piping on swags, because otherwise it would be really difficult to get the skirt underneath the tree with the swags draping off the bottom tier. In this case, I'm cutting around the stamp with a bigger cutter than I did on the rug, because I know I need a certain diameter to get all the way around the brown platform that the tree is standing on. I might even have to cut the brown platform back a little bit so that it doesn't show from underneath the skirt. Now I've got some uneven stamping here on this particular piece, which in the ideal world I'd redo, but I'm just going to orient that towards the back. First though, I'm going to cut out an interior circle to accommodate the trunk. Then, then I'm going to cut a slit in the back in the least attractive area of the stamp piece. Okay, so it easily wraps around the trunk and I'm just going to secure it in the back with a little bit of corn syrup so that it can't fall off the base. You could additionally trim out the bottom of it with some little green dots around the white edge. I think that would look pretty and I'm a more is more person, so you'll see that on a later version of this tree. Now with the skirt down, we're ready to move on to the swags. I'm back to a relatively loose outlining icing that gives a nice natural curve, but which won't break when suspended. And the piping motion is again, like on the candelabra, I make contact, then let it drop, and then make contact once again to break the icing flow, or continue doing two or three swags at a time. Eventually though, I need to rotate the piece so that the swags don't look crooked. I'm doing these kind of irregularly, some longer and shorter than others, just because I think that looks a little more natural. And we're going to do this around the bottom of each tier, slightly shorter on these top tiers so they don't interfere with the ornaments underneath. Now you could do a cranberry garland version of this by piping swags like so, and you'll see that cranberry version on the tree in the foreground. Once the swags are piped, you can come in with loose beadwork icing and then just pipe an array of dots, a line of dots along the swag itself. So th that's the basic process. I'm going to go ahead and continue it all the way around and we'll come back in a few minutes and I'll show you the finished product. So there she is all finished out. I probably spent another half an hour to an hour on her. It's not a small project because there's so much detail on it. If you want it to go quicker, of course, don't decorate it to the nines quite as I have. The other thing to note is that my process would not be do all one layer with all the elements at one time. Instead, I would assembly line it. So I would do all the flocking, the adding of the snow first on every single layer. Then I'd add the ornaments on every single layer. I'd add the treetop star, which we'll talk about in a sec. Then I'd, then I'd put the skirt on and then I'd swag out every single layer. So that just makes the process more efficient than working one layer at a time fully and then moving on to the next one. And she looks just beautiful from almost every angle, and this will be the show-stopping piece to really crown out the vignette. One element that I didn't talk about was the star on top. This is a fondant cutout with some royal icing lines on top and some silver nonpareils also stuck down with thick royal icing. The star itself was gold to begin with and then sprayed with the gold luster spray, stuck on with the green royal icing. So lots of possibilities. You can swap out ornaments as I did up there. I've got candy canes and gingerbread. Or swap out colors altogether and do something kind of atypical, pink and blue for instance for Christmas instead of green and red. Now if you're still questioning some of the other accessories that I didn't cover in this video, namely the fire, the 
plate of goodies for Santa. Those accessories were covered in previous videos, so I encourage you to jump on down to the video description and look for those links. You'll find them there and they'll provide all of those details. And if you haven't seen the assembly of this project, then skip back to last week's video where I put all the big pieces together. Till next video, live sweetly.